The word of God is like a signal on a hill, a lighthouse lighting your way through the darkness of sin, death, hell, and destruction, leading you to the safe harbor of the Father's loving arms through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Wendelin Galloway, copyright 1996. Hello, this is Wendelin Galloway, and this message today is regarding Purim, which we're about to celebrate. And there is so much in the book of Esther that tells you the story of Purim and what actually happened that even for me, after all of these years, I cannot believe the information. And there's more. I'm I'm only going to give you a, um, a small portion of it, but you would do well to read the book of Esther and then start researching Esther, what happened to her in the palace, Vashti, King Ahasuerus, a.k.a. Xerxes, uh, first beautiful wife, and how he lost her. But I will tell you this, that God will make a way when there seems to be no way. And it didn't matter what beautiful Queen Vashti did, she was not going to remain Xerxes' queen because of that position needed to be vacated so that Esther could become queen and Esther could be the instrument in delivering the Jews from complete annihilation. The reason this is important is because there are people who have been praying and believing God for promotions on their jobs. You might have been there uh, for years, or maybe you just came to the company, but God has a plan and a purpose and wants you to be in a position of authority. No different than God's plan was for Esther to become Xerxes, aka Ahasuerus's queen, so that she would be in the position to speak to her husband, the, the king, about the annihilation of the Jews on a certain day in a certain month of the year. Now, what I have found out is that Vashti's been painted in a bad light because people read the text and men especially, their first interpretation of Vashti is that, hmm, She's having a party. King's having a party. He told me to come out and I ain't coming, period. I'm Vashti, the queen. I'm not coming. But there was a reason why. And and when I was a baby Christian and read that, I thought, well, if he sent for her, why wouldn't she come when she knows he's the king? He could even cut her head off. And I thought, There's a story behind that somewhere as to why that that queen, when summoned by the king, did not come out. Let's go to the text and let's read a little bit of this. It was in the days of Ahasuerus, Xerxes. This is chapter one of the book of Esther. Ahasuerus, who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces. Just let me tell you, there's Jews in all 127 provinces. And he is the one who pretty much made that happen. Now, in those days, it says, when King Hazarus sat on his royal throne, which was in Shushan or Susa, the capital of the Persian Empire, in the palace or castle, In the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his princes and his courtiers, the chief officers of Persia, of the Persian and Median army, and the nobles and governors of the provinces were there before him. While he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor and excellence of his majesty for many days, even 180 days, and then these days were And when these days were completed, this is verse 5, the king made a feast for all the people present in Shushan, the capital, both great and small, 
a seven-day feast in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were hangings of fine white cloth of green and of blue cotton fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings or rods and marble pillars. The couches of gold and silver rested on a mosaic pavement of poppery, white marble, mother of pearl, and precious colored stones. This was a wealthy kingdom. Drinks were served in different kinds of golden goblets, and there was royal wine in abundance according to the liberality of the king. And drinking was according to the law. No one was compelled to drink, for the king had directed all the officials of this palace to serve only as each guest desired. Also, Queen Vashti, gave a banquet for the women in the royal house, which belonged to King Ahasuerus, a.k.a. Xerxes. On the seventh day, when the king's heart was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Bistha, Harbana, Bigtha, Abagatha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who ministered to King Ahasuerus as attendants to bring Queen Vashti before the king with the royal crown to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command by the eunuchs. Therefore, the king was enraged and his anger burned within him. Well, now, he's been drinking it up himself with all these people in the court that I I told you he'd been drinking with. And I don't think he was thinking clear because had he been thinking clear, he never would have asked her to come out. He wanted to show off her beauty. This is an amplified translation, and it doesn't tell you something that I had heard back in the 80s by a woman minister. She was a pastor's wife, and she taught this. And um, basically, I'm just going to tell you, he asked her to come out naked in nothing but her crown and her royal jewels. The text itself does not clearly address why Vashti refused to appear. A variety of theories have emerged. According to Esther chapter 1 verse 11, Queen Vashti was told to appear, wearing her royal crown, and one rabbinical tradition interprets this as the king's instruction to wear only her royal crown, in other words, she was told to appear in the nude. According to that tradition, Queen Vashti refused because she did not want to be put on display before a group of salacious, drunken men. This view is not found in the biblical text, nor can it be supported by history. However, it is likely that Vashti refused to appear because she would have been humiliated in some way. The king and his men had been feasting and drinking for seven days. It is almost assured that they did not have noble intentions in calling her to the party. While nothing more specific is noted, the context, especially the reference to her beauty, indicates that her attendance at the feast was sought to entertain the men in some way. Queen Vashti likely knew the potential consequences of refusing the king, but refused she did. Now, remember I told you it never made any sense. The king sends for, and then she says, I'm not coming. The way Almighty God, and I say God did this, there were three to four avenues here of where she could have got her head cut off, banished, just Just putting it simply, she wasn't going to be queen anymore because the Lord decreed and declared it before the foundation of the world. You're a pretty girl. You're the queen. But I got to get you out of there because I need to put one of my women in that place for the nation of Israel to survive. This is why anybody that's anti-Semitic, anybody that hates Israel, Anybody that does not love the Jews, you need to watch out, step back, take a good look at their history, 
because God is for them. Even if they aren't Messianic yet, and when I say that, I mean even when they have not accepted Christ yet, they are the apple of his eye. He will never disown them. He will never dislike them. He will never give up on them. And this is an example of what I'm about to tell you, you need to listen to carefully. I am reading in chapter six of a book written by Josephus. It's called The Antiquities of the Jews. Now the king was desirous to show her, that's Vashti, who exceeded all other women in beauty to those that feasted with him. And he sent some to command her to come to his feast. But she, out of regard to the laws of the Persians, which forbid the wives to be seen by strangers, did not go to the king. Though he oftentimes sent the eunuchs to her, she did nevertheless stay away and refused to come. Till the king was so much irritated that he broke up the entertainment and rose up and called for those seven who had the interpretation of the laws committed to them and accused his wife and said that he had been affronted by her because that when she was frequently called by him to his face, she did not obey him once. And I'll stop right there. This is a woman. This was a really hard time for this woman. This is what I'm trying to tell you. It's like she was damned if she did, damned if she didn't. But the Lord was working all this out because he needed her out of that position. And you can see God's grace in it because, I mean, she could have just died just like that. And she didn't. She was moved out. And it tells you later in the text that a beauty contest was given. They took beautiful women, virgin women. From all 127 provinces, this is what his little um, people, the seven that were supposed to know the law. You can't tell me they didn't know the Persian law, that she wasn't even supposed to be seen among these strangers. And he's asking her to come out naked with nothing but her crown and the royal jewels on in his drunken stupor. So later on, When it looks like, well, we'll get to that. In the chain of events, Esther is crowned queen. Now, there is someone out there that gave a message on Esther. And I understand that their ministry is that they want to teach that Jesus is in everything in this Bible. And he is. But you can't go making things up. This young man accused Vashti of thinking that she was that all that in a box of chips and that she just turned her nose up and didn't come out when the king called her. Uh, there's another uh, thing that I read that said it was believed that Vashti was pregnant, which she definitely was not supposed to be seen out pregnant. She definitely wasn't supposed to be seen among strangers and the king in his drunken stupor. He's asked her to come out in nothing but the crown jewels. So she's basically going to come out naked in nothing but a crown and her jewels. And these were all Persian laws that were not to be broken. See, I call it the wicked laws of the Medes and Persians because once something was written, it couldn't be changed. And if you broke it, you're just in the soup. You can't get out of it. This is why I said Almighty God had this thing set up to remove Vashti by not letting Vashti die, but removing her because he needed Esther in that position. After the beauty contest, and you can you can read the text in here. Uh, in fact, in the Amplified, I will read this part. Her name was Hadassah. And it means, um, I think it means myrtle. And myrtle is one of the most beautiful smelling trees on earth. She was brought up to obey her uncle Mordecai. 
And when they came and took her into the seraglio, into the harem uh, for the virgins, he told her, do not let your race, nationality, your religious beliefs be known. Don't tell that. And he did that for her own safety. Because as always, even while they were in captivity, you've always had people that hated the Jewish nation. God help them. And if you're one of the people out there, God help you. Go repent. Because he says in his word, I will bless those who bless the Jews and I will curse those who curse them. Or you can you can say it a different way. I will bless those who bless Israel. I will curse those who curse Israel. And in these last days, you're going to see Israel come to the, fo the forefront. And there are many, many natural born Jewish people that believe in Jesus Christ. And there are rabbis that believe in Jesus Christ. Don't be fooled in any of that. And if you've done these things, if you've talked harshly against them, you go in your prayer closet and you ask the Father to forgive you in Jesus' name and to give you a heart, a tender heart toward nation Israel and toward the Jewish people who live around you. Make sure that you do that for your own sake, for your own blessing, but also to be a blessing to them. When she went in there, it says here that Hadassah, Esther, Mordecai's niece, she neither had father nor mother. And I, I think I told you in a previous video that the word of God says if your father and your mother, if they choose to forsake you, the Lord will take you up. The Lord will take you up if your own parents don't want you. Hello to all of you children that were given up because your mother had no husband and was having you out of wedlock. And her desire was for you to have a mother and a father and a good life. Remember that. Don't ever hate the persons, the, the, the man and the woman that gave you life. Because God said, if your father and your mother forsake you, the Lord says that he will take you up. And if you've had adopted parents who have done the same thing, that holds true for you. God will take you up. He will never fail you. And anything that he wrote in this book, he will stand by it in your life and he will bring it to pass. Now, Little Hadassah, a.k.a. Esther, she's used to doing what her uncle tells her. In the text, when you read it, you'll find out that she was an obedient child. The maiden was beautiful and lovely. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's command and his decree were proclaimed, and when many maidens were gathered in Shushan, the capital, under the custody, of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's house to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased Haggai and obtained his favor, and he speedily gave her the things for her purification and her portion of food, and the seven chosen maidens to be given to her from the king's palace. They're going to serve her and help take care of her. And he removed her and her maids to the best apartment in the harem. This is God's favor on Esther's life. Esther had not made known her nationality or her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her not to do so. And Mordecai, who was an attendant in the king's court, walked every day before the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what would become of her. Now, I'm going to stop here. There's a, a man of God that talked about Purim a few years ago. He said that when Esther became queen, that um, she's like a diva queen. She ain't that nobody. She's doing her own thing in the palace. She's the queen. She's doing her own thing. No, this girl was raised by her uncle, 
and trained to obey her uncle. And it tells you right here, once she went into the king's court, he walked every day before the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what would become of her. Now, when the turn of each maiden came to go to King Ahasuerus, after the regulations for the women had been carried out for 12 months, since this was the regular period for their beauty treatment, six months with oil of myrrh, six months with sweet spices and perfumes and the things for the purifying of the women. I heard Reverend Tommy Tenney say when the movie One Night with the King was coming out years ago, he said this kind of treatment this many days and months that by the time they were finished, when Esther would walk by the king or anyone, she oozed with fragrance. Everywhere she went, the essence of her fragrance was left behind her. And I, and I believe that. I believe that because there was a certain bath oil that my mother used, and it certainly wasn't like these expensive oils. Ten years after my mother had passed away, you could still find the fragrance in her handbags, her scarves, and in her clothes. Ten years later. I just thought I'd share that with you. Then in this way, the maiden came to the king. Whatever she desired was given her to take with her from the harem into the king's palace. In the evening, she went. And next day she returned into the second harem in the custody of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She came to the king no more unless the king delighted in her and she was called for by name. Now, when the turn for Esther, the daughter of Ab Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter, had come to go in to the king. She required nothing but what Haggai, the king's attendant, the keeper of the women, suggested. And Esther won favor in the sight of all who saw her. This is God's favor again. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the maidens, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. This person that said that Esther was this highfalutin queen that didn't care about anybody. She's laid back and doing her own thing. She was saying and communicating directly or indirectly with her uncle daily before she was even taken into the king's palace and made queen. Don't you know that she was continuously speaking with her uncle? He was her original mentor who helped her get this far in her life. And these other servants, Haggai, the one who gave her the things that she needed, put her in the best apartment. All of these people were this woman's mentor. She did not get there by herself. I mean, I mean, look at modern day uh, celebrities. They got hairstylists, hair colors, nail people, makeup artists, wardrobe mistresses that, that help them with their fashion and what they wear depending on where they're going. So this woman is now the queen and she has all of this help, but she never ever stopped communicating with her uncle Mordecai. I had to say this because I don't like to see women especially men teaching about them, giving women a bad name, a bad rap, whatever you want to call it. Vashti was a victim and she, she could do nothing but to me trust in God because it was God that kept it from her losing her head in the middle of her not coming out naked when the king asked her to. And then here is Esther who is still not telling the king that she is a Jew. And 
Here's another bit of information. Esther's ancestor was King Saul. And they wouldn't have been in this situation where a decree was written for all Jews in all 127 provinces to be annihilated. I only recently in research found out it wasn't just they were going to kill the Jewish people in Shushan and in the whole 127 provinces. They were, to, they were annihilating them, but their wealth, their homes, their goods, whatever they own, when you kill them, then you could take it. Doesn't that sound like Germany? Doesn't that sound like World War II? I'm telling you, this was a thing set up by a wicked man named Haman. And I think he was an Agite. And Saul was supposed to have wiped all of them out. He wasn't supposed to take any of the livestock, the gold, the silver, the women, the children, the housing. You know, sometimes God would tell them, okay, you can take the women for wives, but you have to marry them. You can't just take them and use them. If you don't kill them, then you have to marry them. Because if you go back to the book of Malachi, he explains in there about wanting honorable offspring from your union. But Saul, King Saul was hard-headed, disobedient. He didn't do it. And the Agai king's wife was pregnant and she got away. She was a direct ancestor of the wicked Haman in the book of Esther, who set the king up to have all the Jews annihilated. Esther is the ancestor of King Saul. What Saul did not finish, Esther finished it. She finished it. And there's a lot more detail in this than, than, than information that I can give you today. But you can find this out for yourself by reading it and studying it on your own. The young minister that talked about Vashti and talked about Esther, he gave them both a bad name that they did not deserve. Women had very little say so in their life in those days. But both of these women were blessed by God. Like I said, Vashti did not get her head cut off. And there was one reason after another. She got out of this. She wasn't getting out of the next one or the next one because God needed that position vacated so that Esther could be there to talk to the king. It was a law that you were not to come into the throne room of where the king was without being summoned. Esther told Mordecai, I have not been summoned for 30 days. He said, she said, you and your people and mine, we will fast and pray that I will go in to see the king. Cause he said, do not think for one minute. If you don't go, because I believe you've been put in this position for such a time as this by then, she had, been, she had been queen for about five to seven years, and, and Ahasuerus had been king for 14. Now, what I'm saying to you is, is this. He said, I think you came to the kingdom for such a time as this, for this occasion. Don't think just because you're the queen's wife, or the, I'm sorry, the king's wife, you're going to be spared because you won't. But another way will be made for the Jews to be spared. And she said, after I fast and pray, I will go in. And if I perish, I perish. What boldness, what boldness in the heart of this woman who had been raised by her loving uncle. This same minister said he liked to compare Ahasuerus, Xerxes, as a type of Christ. Well, let me tell you about these people. They were absolutely brutal. You know, you kill a man and put him to death. That's one thing. But they were castrating the Jewish men. 
again, this is a higher demonic uh, a spirit in heavenly places that even then was trying to keep Jesus Christ from coming into the earth by castrating all the men. That didn't work. We have we have the uh, holy innocents that were killed in Egypt because Moses was coming into the earth as a deliverer. It didn't work. Then you have the holy innocents that were killed when Herod was trying to kill a deliverer and it was Jesus coming into the earth. The, the brutality of the Medes and the Persians was just unbelievable. Most, well, the men that were, were in positions of authority in Israel and other nations that they conquered, they would castrate these men and then make these men serve them. And this is where you get the eunuchs that took care of the women in the seraglio or the, or, the, or, the, or the harem. The brutality of it is, is that it's a mental, it's a mental torture here to have to live this way. And if you see the movie that was made by Tommy Tenney and the, the uh, Trinity Broadcasting, One Night with the King, there's a scene where one of the eunuchs talks to Esther and he explains it, but not completely in the detail that I am, but you can see the pain and the torture when he is talking to you. And they did this to people who were high up in the, in the Jewish government or high up in whatever land that they were, um, that they were conquering. And because of this, at one point in the story of Esther, Mordecai overheard some eunuchs that were planning to get Ahasuerus and lay their hands on him. And I think they were going to kill him. And he reported it to Esther and Esther got it to the king that Mordecai had reported that. And nothing was ever done for Mordecai at that point in appreciation for it. Now, I'm going to go back to Esther going in. She said, if I perish, I perish. She could have had her head whacked off at any point as she started down that aisle going to see the king. I have read, some of them had blades, four foot, 11, four feet long, especially if they were a tall, big man with blades this wide to whack your head clean off just like that. And she's walking into this and the king recognizes her and puts forth the scepter that she can speak. Now we're talking about real people here. She gets in there and he, he wants to know why she's in there. She tells him, I want to invite you to a banquet at my, at, at my apartments. Now you think about it. He said he would come. Now think about this. Don't you know that that king had to be sitting there wondering, what in the world is this woman doing? She's going to risk getting her head whacked off to come in here and ask me to come to a banquet? He probably went to bed that night thinking about, is she crazy? She going to risk getting her head cut off? He had to know there's another story in there somewhere. There is another story in there somewhere. So he goes to the banquet and she says, and if it please the king and I found favor in his sight, would you come to another banquet tomorrow? Now I'm thinking he must think she is a nutcase. You going through all of this, going all the way back to you almost got your head cut off. Thank God you didn't need glasses like I got on to recognize her at a distance. So he put that scepter out. And so he tells her yes. 
in the text, she's saying if we were being sold, if they were going to do this or that, but me and my people are to be annihilated. We've been sold. You've been given money to annihilate an entire nation. And I can just see him twisting around and say, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. Uh, who's going to do what to you and your people? Who? That, that wicked Haman right over there. He's the one. The king went out of the, of the dining area wherever they were eating and went out the door into the garden. And I'm thinking, he must have been thinking, I already lost a beautiful wife, Vashti, because of my own big mouth and me being stupid and me being led by the people in there because I asked them for counsel. You can't tell me that somebody in there didn't know, well, King Ahasuerus, we know she didn't come out, but she didn't come out because one of the laws of the Persians is she wasn't supposed to be seen with strangers. And you've asked her to come out naked, nothing but her crown. This was a hard time for this woman. She was damned if she did, damned if she didn't, because God was opening that door to put Esther in for that moment to say, this wicked Haman over here, he sold us. And when he turned back, and you can read it in the text, Haman has realized I have really messed myself up. He's falling over on Esther on the couches because, I mean, they are sitting on cushions. They're not sitting at tables like we're sitting, you know, at the kitchen table or the dining room table. They're not. And so it would have been easy for him to look like that. And, and the king is thinking, will he attack her, my wife, right in front of me? The servants, whatever they saw on King Osiris's face, they put a sack over his head and took him out. And he ultimately got hung on the gallows that he actually had planned to hang Mordecai on because he hated him. He absolutely hated him. And as I researched, Mordecai was more than likely when he came to the palace was probably already castrated also. Remember, I told you this demonic entity over these people was the dead to stop the seed, to stop Jesus Christ from coming into the earth. And wait a minute. Someone had just told me that they saw a report on the Internet where it's believed that they found the Ark of the Covenant. I thought it was found a long time ago, but the Ark of the Covenant and it had live blood on the Ark. And when they tested it, it was all female chromosomes. And it's believed this is blood from Jesus Christ. I can believe that it was whatever number of chromosomes to make a human being and that they were all female because years ago I heard a lecture and the, the man that was a scientist said the miracle was instead of it being a female that looked exactly like Mary, the miracle was that it was a man child and that man child was Jesus Christ. This is just proof about what the doctor who's probably, uh, Dr. Scientist is probably long dead, a theory that he had 50 some odd years ago about the birth of Jesus Christ. But I urge you to read the book of Esther. There are gold nuggets in it for your life, for you to be blessed today about your provision, about your future, about your children about the, the how personal God is with each and every one of us. And all of the, the, the wealth and everything that belonged to Haman, King Ahasuerus gave those things over to Mordecai and to Esther. Because in the text, he finds out that Mordecai had saved his life. And he found out that Esther 
was Jewish and Mordecai. And it says in the text that people feared the God of the Jews, many of them becoming saved. They became believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I urge you, if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, whether you're Jewish, Greek, what, whatever denomination or pagan religion that you're in, he came to earth and died for all mankind. And you can ask him right now into your heart by saying, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I ask you, Jesus, into my heart and I make you Lord of my life and I guarantee you he is going to forgive you. He is going to save you and whatever restoration you need in your life, he is going to restore you and take you into a large place and your life will be better than it has ever been before because he is the God that is able to do more than enough, more than you can even imagine. And look at this little poor girl, Esther, in the book of Esther. Look at, at, at poor Vashti. I mean, she's getting batted around uh, uh, like Serena Williams and Venus out on the tennis court with the, and she's the tennis ball. And one of the things in my research I read, it's believed that Esther and Vashti knew each other and talked to each other in the palace. See, her punishment was she was never to come before the king again. And I'm sure that hurt the king many a night when he stopped and thought about her and thought about how he lost her. This is why he wasn't going to make any mistakes with this wicked Haman and what he had set up. And at one point, I think, if I remember correctly in the text, his wife warned him about Mordecai. She warned him. And to me, he ended up with all 10 of his sons and himself hung on those gallows. This woman lost her husband and all 10 of her sons. Now, don't you know this is a message for men that sometimes you need to take a second look when your wife tells you something? Many a man has lost a blessing, caused himself a problem, and, and, and because of this, lost his life because the wife made mention of something that he should have paid some attention to. There's a scripture that says, iron sharpens iron. Your wife can't be stupid and dumb and don't know anything and ignorant, and she's off on flying saucer in her mind. You can't look at her that way. Because if you consider yourself strong in iron, you married a strong woman who's made of the same iron you're made out of. Created by God, you took her as your wife to walk alongside you in life together, to help each other make it to, to God in eternity in heaven and raise your children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And as the days went on, like I said, in here, it said that many feared the Jews. They're still in captivity, but it says many feared them and became Jews, meaning they began to believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, this is the end for right now. I hope I've been a blessing to you, and I hope to talk to you again real soon and celebrate the day of Purim by thanking God for Esther and Mordecai, and yes, thank Xerxes, a.k.a. Ahasuerus. And most of all, don't forget little Vashti. Bye-bye. Dear beloved friends and supporters of Wendell and Galloway Ministries, we are reaching out to you today with a heartfelt request to support the impactful work that we are doing to spread the gospel message and bring hope and healing to people around the world. At Wendell and Galloway Ministries, we believe that every person deserves to experience the transformative power of God's love and grace. Through our preaching, teaching, and outreach efforts, we are committed to making this vision a reality. However, we cannot do this important work alone. 
We rely on the generous support of individuals like you to fund our programs and initiatives. Whether you can give a little or a lot, your donation will make a tangible difference in the lives of those we serve. If you feel called to support the work of Wendell and Galloway Ministries, we invite you to make a donation by sending a check or money order to the following address. Wendell and Galloway Ministries, Inc. Post Office Box 1600. Bettendorf, Iowa, 52722. We are deeply grateful for your consideration and support. Together, we can continue to spread the love of Christ and bring hope to those who need it most. With gratitude and blessings, the Wendell and Galloway Ministries team, 